This podcast is part of the Democracy Group. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are talking politics and religion without killing each other. I am your host, Corey Nathan. It is an honor to be a part of the Democracy Group. This is a network of podcasts that examines what's broken in our democracy, but more importantly, how we can work together to fix it. And I have a big announcement. We are on Patreon. It's official. So if you join our Patreon, it gives you access to our moderated community chat where you can talk with me and others who've been on the program and others who listen to the program. At higher levels, you get access to uh, to merch, TPNR merch. We got coffee mugs, we got tote bags. It's all really cool. You get ad-free episodes and um, you even get to give me input and um, maybe receive director credits on upcoming episodes. Just go to patreon.com slash politics and religion with the A-N-D spelled out. Patreon.com slash uh, politics and religion. And as always, remember to subscribe or follow and keep writing those reviews. The links to the Patreon and the easy way to write the review is um, it's all in our show notes. So it all helps so that we can continue having great conversations like the one we're having today with Hagar Hajar Shamali. Um, Hagar Hajar Shamali is, well, I'm not going to continue calling you by all three names if that's okay. But and plus you like it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Hagar Hajar Shamali is a YouTube host and creator of Oh My World. Uh, they, by the way, do you like say it different every time? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not even oh, I, your intro yet. I use it like as though I'm saying, oh my God, because world news is crazy. It is and crazy. Yes, it's there's never a shortage of, of the absurdity. And so often I'll say in the show, you know, like, oh my world, what oh were my they world. thinking? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Easy to remember too. So uh, Hagar is the host and creator of Oh My World, which uh, it covers the major world news of the week in an easy to understand and really fun and entertaining way. Hagar is also an adjunct professor at Columbia University School of International Public Affairs and a non resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Geoeconomic Center. She writes on national security and is featured regularly as a guest uh, expert on MSNBC, CNN, BBC, Bloomberg, and one of my favorite programs, Politicology. Prior to all this, Hagar was director of communications and spokesperson for the U.S. mission to the U.N., United Nations, under President Obama. Uh, she was spokesperson for terrorism and financial intelligence at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Uh, director for Syria and Lebanon at the National Security Council at the White House, and she was a senior policy advisor on Asia and policy advisor on the Middle East in the Office of Terrorist Financing and Financial Crimes at the U.S. Treasury. Clearly, she is 184 years old, having done <laughs> all of this. Um, but the most important thing you need to know about Hagar is that she, her three kids, and her dad are really excellent dancers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they are featured often. I like to say that my dad in particular is my secret weapon oh, because man. he's so funny. <laughs> it is It is so much fun if you really start to dig into the TikTok and the YouTube and, and places where Hagar is showing up. It, we're, we're, she, cover, she has a snack of, Hagar has a snack of covering really serious topics in an in-depth and nuanced way. Uh, but mixing in just enough fun to like remind us that we're all human and, and we're kind of all in this together. So it's really great. And I'm just so glad to be able to do this with you. Gar. How, how you doing? I'm good. I am so excited to do this. I love how you found me, that you heard me on Politicology and you reached out and you were so complimentary. I was so excited to have this conversation and I got to know your podcast and I'm just so impressed with it. And your title alone is so necessary, especially mm -hmm. right now. And it's how I feel as well, um, especially given my own background, both personal and professional background, yeah. uh, which is very mixed and I'm sure we'll get into it. But uh, but I'm doing great. I'm really excited for this. Oh, good, good, good. So I was originally going to ask you, given you know the dancing and the content that that you create with your, I was going to ask you to start off with your beautiful rendition of Don't Stop Believing using the kitchen faucet as the microphone, but your post today uh, that I saw today just really struck a, ner a nerve. So I was, I I'm getting chills just thinking about it. I was hoping that you could tell us about Zaytuna. Sure. So, um, so first I'll, I'll note that my, the, the mission of, of Oh My World 
is to highlight all of these issues in a fun and easy way because it's meant to affect behavior and it's meant yeah. to educate. Um, and it's to highlight, and I like to highlight in particular or expose the activities of dictators and human rights abusers while sharing the stories of those doing good around the world. The crush the list. People- the crush list. Exactly. And so obviously the dictators and human rights abusers are on my weekly shit list, which I view as like my own sanctions list. I worked in sanctions in the government for a long time. And the crush list is the is the part to really show that there are so many people doing good around the world. And maybe people want to find those uh, who are engaged in something good or a cause that they can support and donate and feel good about themselves as well, that they're doing something to to push uh, to push for something good. So Zaytuna was this week's crush list, and it is a small group group of women. Uh, I called them Bubbies and Tetas. Bubbies is grandmother uh, in Yiddish, I believe. And Tetas is grandmother in Arabic. And there are 12 of them. They were established about 20 years ago and they meet and it's, it's divided equally. Six Palestinian identities, six Israeli slash Jewish identities. And they're older women and they meet over a meal to share, to talk about, just to talk in general and share their experiences. And they develop empathy through their shared experiences and dialogue. And, and with that, they advocate for peace in the region and, uh, and between both sides. And, they've been doing this for 20 years, even though some have left and or moved on or, or, or passed away. And, and it remains 12 of it remains as 12 women. And in especially given what's going on now, I found this is particularly moving because you they still with everything that's happening, they lean on each other with given everything that's happening and 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 how polarized things have become and emotional and sided they they still lean on each other to find strength to find peace to find empathy and it's one of the things i teach my own students at at, at columbia where i teach is how to speak it, just how to have civil dialogue and how how to do it in a way where you develop empathy for the other side. You may not necessarily agree with the other side, and that doesn't need to be the point. Uh, although if you look at, at at a Twitter feed, you would think that that's the majority of people don't realize that. Right. It's not. But but developing empathy just makes you see another point of view, and make and and understanding it just kind of it makes the whole dialogue it takes it down a notch. It makes the temperature down. And, and, and yes, you can develop a lot. You find shared interests or, or, or shared goals. And so Zaytuna, that's what they do. And I just found it very moving, especially given everything going on, that they remain this way and that they're still trying to beat that drum and say, you know, it's really important that, that, that we find these shared, they have shared trauma and shared uh, grief and, uh, and that they find strength in each other. And I just thought it was so beautiful. I would love to be in that room and maybe this, the original CBS story covered this and it, and it looks like they have a film or mm-hmm. um, some more some more content coming out. Um, I would love to be in that room uh, more as uh, instruction, because when when events unfold, whether it's the return of hostages or a particularly uh, uh, large, uh, violent uh, attack, uh, you know, on the part of Israel in um, in in uh, in Gaza, uh, how those conversations go, and how each person, each individual that's participating in the conversation handles it. Um, do they establish personal practices? Are there a set of guidelines for the group as a whole for these twelve incredible women? Um, ha- do do you have a sense of how that goes? No, I only know that they meet regularly to, to discuss over a meal yeah. and they do it weekly or biweekly and they have a motto uh, that they live by, which is called refusing to be enemies and which is the name of their documentary, by the way, there's a documentary based on them, as you just mentioned, and that's the name of it, refusing to be enemies. And I would imagine, I mean, as you see with anything um, going on lately, yeah. how, how difficult conversations might become, but let me, but if if you'll allow me, I'll give sure. you the the two minute crash course on the primer I give on civil dialogue, on engaging in civil dialogue to my students. And this works. I was trained in this by a bipartisan uh, organization that promotes bipartisan dialogue and such. But and so this works whether you're speaking to someone of a different party, or whether it's your crazy uncle at Thanksgiving, <laughs> or whether it's someone on the other side of this conflict. If you if you take a side at all, foreign policy people like me don't tend to take sides really because 
you see all of it and your goal is ultimately peace. But anyway, if you're sided or if you feel sided about any issue, right, any conflict, any, any, any political issue, uh, any moral issue and so on. And so if you are faced with somebody with whom you vehemently disagree, however, the conversation came up, um, the, the, the lesson goes is that the first step is to ask as many questions as possible. Mm. Just keep asking question after question. Why do you feel that way? How did you start viewing things that way? Is there a certain example that, that made you feel this way or that angers you or upsets you or whatever it might be? And you ask all these questions and you listen as, and just sit there and listen. Even if the other person is saying something that makes your blood boil, just sit there and listen. You will have your turn. And remember in this whole time that your goal is not to convince the other person of your view. It's just to share your view. Um, so you ask all these questions, you listen. The second step is that, well, or inevitably the second part is that by listening, you end up developing this empathy because inevitably that person is going to share a story that has colored their perspective. And it's usually something personal that's happened to them or something that's happened to a relative that has made them feel strongly about whatever it might be. And when they share that story, automatically you end up feeling empathy for them. And the third part is that then you, you share your side and say, well, I, you know, that's so interesting that you view this this way and that that's why I view it this way because of X, Y, Z. And automatically when you've gone through that process of just asking all those million questions and listening, when you respond, it's inevitably going to be calmer because you're going to feel some kind of compassion for that other person, even if you don't agree. And if you remember that your goal is not to convince them that it's just to enrich your view and enrich your perspective, it becomes, it just becomes a general civil dot. Now, and by the way, this is how normal talk w has always been. <laughs> yeah. It's only recently, um, you know, maybe you could say since 2016, since things have gotten really heated politically here. Um, but I think between social media and 2016 election since, and so on, these, this, ability to dialogue this way has disappeared. Right. Uh, and so it's something I can tell you if for me with the commentary I do with the content I do, I am faced with this nonstop, nonstop. I get people who will come up to me who are angry about something or they vehemently disagree with me. And they're like, I just want to tell you, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so I'll sit there and I'll say, you know, I'll do the same thing with them. And I find that they, you know, I feel enriched just listening to their story. Even if I don't, if I don't agree with them in the end, it, it's helpful to see another perspective. So, yeah. um, so, and I think that's why the Zaytuna story, the reason I was moved by it, aside from the fact that it's so powerful, given what's going on, is that we're seeing this problem, I feel much more so in the United States than in the region. And, and I know that because of how many friends I have in the region, how close I am to people there. And I don't mean to generalize. You have a lot of people who are very sided, mm -hmm. uh, who are very angry, but it's very different for those living this conflict than those in the United States who are screaming about it, to be honest with you. Yeah. And I feel that they need to understand that their, their job is not to polarize, make things worse. It's to support the peace process. It's to support a solution. And the Zay Tuna story is an example of that. They do that on a very small scale, but but that is what they're trying to do. It's interesting because what we're doing by engaging in that practice of listening and asking questions is we're disrupting our own impulse to be quick to fight, be quick to throw the next rhetorical grenade or what have you. Uh, and it does it does something for for everyone involved in that conversation. I know when I was on the receiving end of that, a very I've shared this story before, but a very dear friend of mine who actually has been at Columbia a number of times uh, to participate in the protests there. Uh, she's a social justice leader. She's a, a wonderful, wonderful person, but we're on very different sides of this issue. I have family in Israel, um, but her she was one of the first people who called me after October 7th. And that week, her first question was, how you doing, brother? How you doing? Like sincerely, like, and then um, she, my head was still kind of mashed potatoes. I, I just, it was so hard to make sense of what was going on. And one of our extended family members was missing. Subsequently, we, we learned that he died on October 7th. Oh, I'm um, so sorry. But her, yeah, thank you. Um, but her, everybody else, thank God, was accounted for and they're safe. Um, but she just asked questions that day. So later in subsequent conversations that we had, I felt that my friend Lisa, had heard me, you know, and I've been on the other side of that too. Um, so I probably identify most closely with guys like Ron and Mike, you know, right of center, but anti-Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm 
very oversimplifying, but that's that's kind of where I stand. So my greatest, uh, the the greatest, the 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 most heated that it gets isn't necessarily with people even to the far left. Um, it's with people that are Trump supporters um, or uh, are in that general camp. And um, what I've noticed in my conversations, it's happened three times in the last month where I had an opportunity to practice like what David Brooks has written about in his his last book or Mani Guzman, just incredibly, her incredible distillation in her book in, um, I think it was December of 22. I never thought of it that way, of just like asking questions, that radical curiosity. And each time some version of, my favorite was my buddy in Jersey, uh, this, this guy, John, at the end of it, he said something interesting. Um, he said it was along the, he just worded something that could have been dismissed and very, uh, you know, that, that I could have looked over, but he said it in a different way. He said, thank you for hearing me. Mm -hmm. Not like, Hey, thanks for the talk. Good talk. You know, like did, it, he worded it in a very specific way. Like, thank you for hearing me because his, he, what he was used to is any time that it came, came out that he's a conservative, a Trump's or even a DeSantis supporter, something in that realm he's used to getting the shit beat out of him, <laughs> you know, like right. rhetorically speaking. So thank you for hearing me. Before we move on, I wanted to tell you about something else that's important. Money, <laughs> uh, specifically your money. In all seriousness, I wanted to tell you about my advisor and my friend, George Mesa. George runs Mesa Wealth Management and with George, it's not just about money. It's about helping us manage our present and plan for our future. And unlike a lot of other firms out there, George and I actually have a relationship. He knows me. He knows my family. And I know his wonderful family. I also know his firm and the incredible team he's put together from his chief investment officer to some of the other great people in his office, like Jessica, their head of operations that are always there to help me and with all aspects of our portfolio. You see, the thing is, I got a lot going on. I guess we all got a lot going on and I don't have the time to watch our investments all day, every day. And even if I did, I don't have the experience and expertise that George's team collectively has. So we get the entire Mesa Wealth Management team, all their expertise and all their integrity. And again, it's based on George knowing me personally, knowing my goals and even the kind of risk that's appropriate for me to take, which by the way, could change up from one season to the next. And they're on top of all of that. So if you want George Mesa and Mesa Wealth Management to be on your team, just visit their website, mesawealth.com. That's M-E-Z-A wealth.com, www.mesawealth.com. And that will also be in our show notes, so you can check that. And now, back to our show. I was, I was also curious. So um, there's a lot of what you said there that that really resonates, um, and, and depending on where you know, which hat you're wearing in the conversation, but radical curiosity, asking questions, developing that sense of empathy in ourselves, as opposed to quickness to get into the fight. Um, so I was also curious um, on any given issue, you, you have a professional vocational background uh, in this stuff. So as someone, you know, who's been doing this vocationally, how do you formulate an informed understanding of what's happening in, in a like a complex conflict like what's happening in Israel Palestine. Yeah, you know your your listeners can't see me now but I have a huge grin on my face because this is the single question I get over and over and over again um and which speaks a lot to the the the, the state of our media right now. Um I I am a voracious consumer of content and I have to read a ton mm. in order to do what I do. And even though I have, I have intern researchers, I have a gaggle of interns, um, basically, which is how I survive. <laughs> and, and I have, so I've intern researchers who are amazing and, but even with their research, even what they give me, and it's not that I don't trust it. I still feel I have to go read the articles myself yeah. and, and read a bunch of them. And I, and I read a whole group of a group of them. And I don't trust, I don't, I almost don't trust any headline anymore. Um, and I can give you a lot of examples as to why, even from, from outlets that I've always trusted, um, that I really don't, if I, if I really want to find something where I just want the facts and I want to make sure 
or hope at least that the facts aren't omitted or editorialized, then the wires are the best place for that, right? So Reuters, AP, um, Bloomberg, AFP, Agence France Presse, those, those outlets, anything that's a wire is just going to give you the facts on the ground. But sometimes you also want the story piece of it. I mean, sometimes you, in order to inform your opinion better, or maybe you're not getting enough um, color to it, you want a reporter who's speaking to someone on the ground and has a, a story to tell. And so I'll still mix it with BBC, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, NPR, Radio for Europe. I mean, I, I it goes on. Um, I and and I and I read from outlets I don't like. Also, mm-hmm. I don't like Al Jazeera. I will read it anyway. I I don't really like Fox News. I'll read it anyway. Um, there are times that Fox is covering something that that the more liberal media won't because they don't want to make it in my opinion in my 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 speculation is that they don't want to make Biden look bad or they don't want to make right the left look bad and but that's not healthy either so i really do take it from everywhere and one of the taglines i say for my show is that we do our homework so you don't have to um <laughs> but it is it is arduous work it is yeah. a lot of work so I, I love what i do if i didn't love what i do it wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't be able to to do this but um but it's very difficult and i take the research part very seriously because I I really don't want a mistake there. And I really want to make sure that something is, especially when you're presenting something that is complicated or nuanced, you know, I really belabor over every single word and every single sentence. And that has never been made more difficult than with the Israel-Gaza conflict. And by the way, so I, I launched Oh My World four years ago. It's been four years. This conflict has always been the one I dreaded the most to talk about because before you even open your mouth, people are throwing tomatoes at your face. Yeah. And, and especially when you are a foreign policy person and you don't take an obvious side, people don't like that. They want you to take a side. They want to be tribal. They want to follow. They want to put you in a box. And, um, and, and, and that's just, you can't do that with this conflict or any conflict. Right. And it's, you have to be honest and you have to share every, every piece of it. Um, and in, and this one in particular, I find that if you're not, um, well, at least the hate that I get is mostly from the pro-Palestinian side that because they're angry, they don't feel that I'm a pro-Palestinian activist enough. Right. And that's not my job. My That's not my job. It's not how I feel. I feel as though I'm an educator. I lived this conflict in the White House. Um, I know a lot about it. I want to explain it to you. I want to share about it. Um, I have zero tolerance for terrorist groups. I worked in counter-terrorist financing. Yeah. Hamas was in my portfolio, among other terrorist groups of that region. And, uh, and I know those guys, I know those thugs, I know what their goals are. I know what they want to do. I have zero, zero tolerance for them and, um, or any excuse for their behavior. And, um, and so, and, and so that's been trying because it means that when it, when I craft the scripts that I craft for my videos, um, it's, you know, generally for the, in for, let's put it on average, on average, it takes about an hour to two hours to script, uh, and, and filming, it takes no time, but it, it takes between an, one to two hours to script, uh, a, a typical one to two minute video for me. Uh, when it's an Israel Gaza story, it could take up to five to six hours oh, because man. I, I'm going over every single piece. I want to make sure that, that I, sh- I'm fair and that I'm honest and that every word can't be misconstrued to mean something else. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been, it's painful, but it's important too. you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's important every yeah. week. I say, I'm not going to do an Israel Gaza video that week. And, uh, and I do about five to seven videos a week and, uh, but every week there's something new. So, you know, it is what it something is. Something new every <laughs> yes. week. So I'm sure that a lot of folks who are listening are curious about a few things. One is you being a teacher, uh, you're a professor and arguably the epicenter of student pet protests on elite college mm-hmm. campuses around the U.S. Um, so they're curious to get an insight on how that's been on the ground. You know, you, we hear we hear a lot of the nut picking stories, uh, you, you know, in the news over the last several months. So we're curious about that. But I, I'm also curious how how your interactions have gone, how how you choose to engage when you choose not to engage. Like, I'm really curious about how how that's been for you over the last few months. 
Oh, wow. Okay, get ready. Okay. So um, so we'll start with the Columbia protests. Um, as you mentioned, I'm an adjunct associate professor. I teach at the School of International and Public Affairs, which is important because that's grad school. And grad students are different. Um, you know, frontal lobe is attached. They are a bit, their judgment and instinct is a bit more spot on. They're more willing to listen and uh versus undergrad. In my in my experience, from when I saw this, this uh this round, this since the fall. Um We'll talk about, so if if you talk about the end of the protests, um, although I don't really know where to begin because we had the protests since October 7th. Let's yeah. start a little bit from the beginning. Okay. Because the administration, in my opinion, made a mistake, made a big mistake at the very beginning in not, in 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 being afraid a little bit to talk and to set the record straight and to to guide and, and, and steer these students the right way. This is a conflict that is extremely complicated. Um, that that these students, the only phase of this conflict they have lived, if they were even aware of it before October seven, which the majority were not. Yeah. For, but even if you, so uh, some of them are aware. Those who aren't aware or are aware, for their lifetime, the only piece of this conflict they know is the last, let's say, twenty years. Barely. Okay. Barely. I mean, five, let's say five years, but anyway, <laughs> let's say 20 years. I put 20 years because the, in, 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 in the region, things were very different it, for the, for the last 20 years. It's been, you've had in Israel, you've had Netanyahu, Mr. quote unquote, Mr. Security, who's per, pursued policies a certain way, um, where you had a majority of the population who no longer believed that there could be a two-state solution. And you had an increasing settlements, so on and so forth, right? And then on the Palestinian side, just a government that was more and more feckless by the day that that passes, more and more corrupt, more weak, a Hamas gaining strength, Netanyahu even feeding that division between the two. Um, this is this is what they you know. They don't know 1993 Oslo Accords. They don't know the roadmap. They don't know the sentiment of the Palestinian Israeli Palestinian conflict back then, when there was genuine hope for a two state solution. And the spoiler of that was Hamas. So they don't know any of this. And, and it's hard for them to really know it. I mean, if they studied it, maybe they'd understand a bit better, but they're not really studying it. And I can give you examples of, of, of how little they studied about this conflict. But the point is, this is all they know. And and they are they also are not in a generation of of kids who either are living the post world war 2 environment or being taught by teachers who are who lived the post world war 2 environment right i didn't live the post world war 2 world but my teachers did right. and they shared that with me right so i was raised understanding the importance of the state of israel it didn't matter what religion i was um for those wondering uh, i am like i said i am an open book my mom is uh, both my parents are from lebanon my per my personal background features very heavily in my views and my um, well, views in my in my desire to fight injustice and to shine a light on on the on things going on around the world. Both my parents come from Lebanon. They fled the civil war. Um, my mom is is Lebanese Jew, and my dad is Lebanese Christian, oh. and uh, which is very different from the rest of my family as well. By the way, so I have these discussions with my own family. When you asked about who I choose to engage with, uh, um, I must engage with my family when they try to lecture me on this. The side that is uh, Syrian in particular, anyway. I'm like, I'm like a mutt, Middle Eastern mutt. But anyway, <laughs> um, so this is this is what they knew. They didn't know the phase from before. And the administration, I found, was very weak and very scared in guiding them the right way to explain to them, this is, you know, let me give you a crash course on this conflict. Come and ask us questions. This is why, um, this is how the state of Israel was created and why, and so on. This is what anti-Semitism is and means. Um, and Islamophobia, by the way, this is what it is and means. This is when you say this, that is anti-Semitic because that's something that a lot of students to till today will argue that when they say over and over again, that Jews control Washington or the media or, uh, or, or so on. They still don't believe that that's anti-Semitic right. and it's just, they weren't raised. I think it's, it's a difference of generation and time period and, or maybe it wasn't a priority to teach in school the way it was when I was in school because of the generation anyway, um, because of the, of the political times, um, 
the school didn't do that. They didn't explain when they would go out there and say that Zionists should die or that uh, w- when they would call for global intifada. And by the way, I have photos of all of this. I mean, I yeah. walked by the protests and this is very easy to look up. Um, they, they, the school just didn't guide them. They kind, they were kind of silent and it took a few weeks, three weeks maybe. And that after October 7, I mean, to wait three weeks to, to really, they had a few emails, but, but it took them a few weeks to really get out there and say like, okay, wait a minute, you know, we don't want doxing and we don't want anti-Semitism and we don't want Islamophobia and, and, and anti-Arab hate and so on. It's a bit late by then. And, and so this was a big mistake from the beginning and there, the view at Columbia generally was, you know, this is a, a campus of, uh, where we really encourage freedom of expression and student activism is a very rich part of our history. So we, we kind of encourage the students to, to, to discover on their own and figure this out and figure their voice and exercise their voice. And that's beautiful, but you're not doing the students any service. In my opinion, you're not doing the students any service by not guiding them on the guardrails of that. Right. And that was the problem I had with the administration and with the students and with the professors, by the way. When I addressed this with my class, my class is on communications. And if there's communications features very prominently in this conflict. And if anything, I would say now half of it is an information war and Mm. we could get to that, um, especially lately. Uh, And and so I couldn't not address this. And I was told I, I we talked about it in five of my classes in a row. And all I saw, the only way I started out the class would be, you know, like, how's it going? It seems tense. How's it going? And then no matter what side students were on and you could tell that there were different sides, they all agreed on the same things, that it was awful, that the tension was awful, that the words being used were awful, that the WhatsApp groups were being co-opted by extremists, either students or outsiders, that they hated how it felt on campus, you know. And it, we really were able to foster this good dialogue. And they told me I was the only professor addressing this or one of the only ones. Mm. So I offered to the administration that, you know, let, let's do a town hall. Let me do this because at the end, and this gets back to your point. Yeah. They want to be heard. They want to be heard and engaged. But what Columbia did was a lot of webinars, right? Like virtual webinars. Oh, one way. Yeah, they're being talked at. And so maybe they could ask a question. Maybe they can't, but that's not what people want. They want to be heard. And even if it's painful to hear what they have to say, or it's your job as the professor or the administration to guide them, to say, you know what, that's, let me, let me, you know, hold up. That's, you know, stop screaming or, Hey, that's what you just said. There's offensive. And let me explain to you why and why that matters and why that doesn't help get to a solution. Right. That's, that's, and, and this is the part that I found really, really difficult. So to sum up, and I know I feel like I'm talking, I had to give you all this background Sure. toward the end, toward the end of the protests, when you had the first arrests, um, by the, by the administration, and then the encampment came back, um, the encampment came back stronger. And then the administration tried to take a different turn and tried to negotiate with them. And they genuinely tried to negotiate with them for eight days and eight nights. And I'm telling you, we were updated over email throughout the middle of the night, all day. They were really trying to negotiate in good faith. But um, but in my in my opinion, the students were steered wrong. And these are young kids. These are like 18, 19, 20-year-old kids. And they reached out to a lot of people on the outside, some of whom are affiliated with U.S.-designated terrorist organizations, in particular, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which has featured prominently in protests. I mean, you'll see a lot of posters featuring the featuring leaders from this organization or their flag. Um, and that's scary for many reasons. Um, or they reached out to, quote unquote, protest consultants who are kind of like agitators. They agitated right. since the 60s through George Floyd protests. I mean, you name it. They find a protest, they go agitate it. Um, um, and and that's how they were steered wrong in their language, in their in their behavior, certainly taking over that building, Hamilton, Hamilton Hall. Um, I thought the university had no choice but to but to do the second round of arrests because, A, that's violent. Um, but B, they had when they arrested the, the folks there, 40 percent of them were outsiders. And that's extremely dangerous yeah. for the student body. You right. can't do that. Um so anyway, so that that sums up that part in term. You asked about who I engage with, who I choose to engage with. Um, I really if you look at my social media, if you look at the Instagram and YouTube videos, I really do engage with almost everybody. So long as it's not 
if like, if I don't engage, sometimes it's cause I don't understand what they're saying. You know, Gen Z has a different language. Um, <laughs> sometimes I really legitimately don't understand it. Um, or if it's just straight up offensive and they just want to be like, you know, they just want to be annoying or like some kind of face behind a bot, um, behind an image. Uh, then if I, if I respond, it's only for the algorithm, but there are people I've responded to where I've, where I've been very compassionate. And I'll say like, I know you're trying to, I know that what your goal is, is actually because you want, you want peace. Yeah. And this is my goal too, you know, but you know, I'm, I wish you all the luck. And I get, I've gotten a lot of, it makes me really happy when I see people respond and, and they'll soften their tone. They'll, they'll be like, Oh, okay. Thank you. And yeah. Danielle Allen talks about that too. Um, her work on democracy, renovate um, innovations and renovations. She, she's, she's been attacked and doxxed and, but the, when she's engaged in a civil way and in a curious way, the, the temperature comes down so quickly when it's a real person, um, mm -hmm. you know, so she shared some, some really terrific stories on how the first back and forths and emails were just curse filled and a raging person. And finally, when the person was convinced by the third back and forth or fourth back and forth, that Danielle was genuinely curious, uh, Professor Allen was genuinely, genuinely curious about why they feel so heated about this issue, then they had a really productive dialogue. Oh, yeah, um, it was it was so interesting. But I it seems to me that there were there was low hanging fruit uh, that the university, it's easy for me to sit here, I'm not a college administrator, uh, you know, to, to, to Monday morning quarterback, they call it. But it seems that be using it as a teaching moment for students, to understand how to effectively um, uh, protest, how to effectively, um, you know, uh, work out those First Amendment freedoms, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, these other freedoms, but also within the proper confines of American, uh, our, our American constitutional um, structures, where time, place, and matter, manner matter. You know, all of that does matter. But how to engage with groups of students as well as one on one, um, that's a um, that's a choice collectively as an administration, but also individually. Um, so are, are there times when you say, OK, this is you, you talked a little bit about on social media, but what about in person where you have to say to yourself, OK, uh, this is not going to go well. Um, so I'm going to abstain courteously and not engage. Are there times and what are the signs? What are the red flags that you see when, when that happens, if it happens? Oh, wow. God, that's a good question. Um, and, okay. So there's a lot that happens that I don't, I don't, um, that I won't speak on because for this, for this reason, you know, and, um, or, or that, or like you said, that there's a, there's a, place and time for it. Um, I'll give you a good example from, from the recent, from this week where you had four hostages who were rescued. Thank God. Yeah. Um, for rescue, four hostages who were rescued. Um, the, and then immediately after, and this is what I meant when I said the information war immediately after were, was uh, a headline headlines coming out that said that the, that the Hamas run health ministry said that 274 Palestinians had died because of this, uh, because of this raid automatically. When I saw that, I knew something was wrong. Yeah. I knew because, be, but, but, but people don't do this for a daily, for a living, right? right? Like I do this for a living. I know what a raid will look like. I worked in the U S government for 12 years. I worked very closely with our military. Um, you know, it's, it doesn't make sense automatically. I knew I, automatically it was very obvious to me either because the number in part felt a little bit inflated and it's coming from Hamas. So how can you trust it? But also because I'm watching Hamas as they are, as their military and governing capabilities become more and more decimated, they're trying to harp on this information war even more heavily. Mm. And their audience is the United States because there is a young audience here. And it's not just young, but there is an emotional audience that feels very strongly that is just eating that information up coming from right. them and they're not questioning it and they don't know to question it. I mean, I understand, like I said, they're not the ones who they've not worked with their military in war before. They don't know how it works. But when I saw that number automatically, I was like, wait a minute. First of all, I, I'm, 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 you're Hamas. I'm going to hesitate to believe that number to begin with. Israel says it's under hundred. You say it's 274. Let's say it's somewhere in the middle. Um, we already know that a big chunk of them are going to be militants, but the, Hamas is not going to say that. We And we know that why, because we know that for anybody who read the story of how it happened, you had 
two groups, if you will, two convoys who saved the hostages. One was for Noah, who was kept in one apartment, and one was for the three men who were kept in another apartment. By the way, that apartment included a reporter who works for a uh, an, an outlet called the Palestine Chronicle, which is a nonprofit based in Washington state, which we'll, I'll get to that later. But anyway, okay. I was public about that. So that means that U.S. donations are going to sponsor terrorism. I mean, I mean oh, the, wow. the DOJ is going to be knocking on their door. If I were them, I would lawyer up immediately. So, or maybe not, because I'm not sure they're going to sustain this. But if, um, so you had these two convoys, two groups doing this hostage operation. And the one that was, that was rescuing the men came under fire, came under intense fire. So much so that their first vehicle, uh, stopped working because of all the fire. They moved to another vehicle. That vehicle also came under fire, also uh, broke down. They had to move to a third vehicle. They almost didn't make it out. So this, this crossfire, if you read this, anybody who reads this, you're going to think, well, wow, like how long did that, did that last? How long is that, that engagement, that exchange of fire? How long is that going? The Israelis were able to escape with the hostages, meaning they obviously killed a lot of the militants. So that number, as it is, I don't believe it. Let's put it somewhere in the middle. A large group of it is going to be militants. I still believe you're going to have civilians, of course, because the Israelis pursued a military strategy that's common called the ring of fire or wall of fire, which is that when you're doing something like this, you try to distract the militants towards something else. And that's why they had air stri airstrikes at the same time. Anyway, but the fact is that it's 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 I thought about doing a video explaining this because I saw social media blow up yeah. about these numbers and they started people started doing some kind of weird math where they're equating. Oh, well, one Israeli equals this many Palestinian civilians and so on. And 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 it's so wrong and it's not fair. And people shouldn't even try to be trying to make this kind of math. And you, I even saw people who have you know, really reputable people trying to take some kind of side, you know, human rights people saying like, well, this is, this is not protection of civilians. And, and, and I was thinking there, I'm like, well, it, it sure, maybe protection of civilians uh, could have been better, but by the way, um, hostage taking is also against the rules of the Geneva convention. Right. So if you really want to go down this path, let's go down it. Let's right, right. be fair and talk about both sides. And Israel's between a rock and a hard place. They can't just let, you can't have intelligence saying that you know where your hostages might be and that you as a military have high mid to high confidence that you could get them out and that and then you just sit on your hands if that were to get out that would be a scandal for any go any democratic government so they this what are they going to do and and people are saying well but they did it in broad daylight they did it in broad daylight to make it more successful because they they wouldn't have they caught everybody off guard anyway i didn't want to go into this question of the numbers um because i figured i was like you know what this is painful for people on both sides. People on both sides. It's it's there's jubilation in Israel. There's also pain in Israel for the hostages who are still there. Yeah. There's pain on this on the sides of the Palestinian civilians who did die. Who, by the way, came out to blame Hamas for this. Right? They're they're not trying to they. And and you want that? You want them to feel? You know, Hamas, you're putting me in danger. Look at what you did. So I just felt, you know what? It's not the right time to to right. go out there and harp on this. This is. I'm it's it's getting it's a distraction. And I the video I ended up doing, which will come out later today, is actually about um, why I feel that we are nearing an end to this intense part of the Israel Gaza war and and to take a bigger picture look at, at, at everything. And, and there are a lot of moving parts that show that give me reasons for hope. And so I did the video on that instead. And by the way, for, for folks who are interested in these topics and really well informed, yet really digestible um, in, information about these really important um, events that are happening around the world. Oh, my world. It's uh, on YouTube. And you, do you also um, publish it on uh, Instagram Reels and in other places? Okay. Yes, it's the heart of all my world lives on YouTube. So thank you so much for that shout out. I really appreciate it. Um, please subscribe. It's free. Um, so it's it lives on YouTube and YouTube shorts, but all the content is also shared on Instagram and TikTok. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we're going to we're going to do make sure that we uh, we do that again at the end of there's so much <laughs> I want to talk to you about because usually I start with your background. We haven't even talked about your interesting background and your champions, your mentors. Yeah, um, because there's you really there's so did your research. <laughs> oh, man. Well, but there's like but once i started thinking about your background your professional background there are so many there are so many different things that are happening around the world that i wanted to ask you about and we can only cover so much but um, there are two in particular um one obviously as um 
it has to do with Ukraine. So one of your roles was as spokesperson for terrorism, financial intelligence at the US Department of Treasury. So I was hoping you could explain the significance of a recent decision by the EU with support from the US um, to utilize the, I think I'm getting this right, utilize the profits from frozen Russian assets to help Ukraine fight the war. So nice. am so I we're really going right? to nerd out. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, really going to nerd out now. All right. Awesome. So of all the series of jobs that, that you listed, a big chunk of that time was spent on sanctions and counter illicit finance. And it's the thing I love to nerd out about the most. And uh, and so that's the topic that you're basically asking about. So um, so briefly, the decision that was made was you had um, about three hundred billion dollars in frozen Russian state assets between the United States and Europe. This was this was done immediately after February, um, after the invasion of Ukraine in February twenty twenty two, and uh, and about sixty billion, sixty to sixty seven billion dollars of that is in U.S. dollars. So that's what we have access to. Um, the rest is in Europe. So most, basically, most Elon Europe. Musk's uh, lunch money, daily lunch. Money. Yeah, <laughs> suck money. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Elon Musk, if you're listening. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. Oh, it's a ton of money. And and it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. These are state assets. These are foreign reserves. What that means is that, and this is what every government does this, where, uh, well, especially foreign governments, um, they they have their reserves. They don't want to keep it in their currency. They decide to pit people keep it somewhere where the currency is stable, where it grows, where it'll have a return on investment, um, where it could be safe. And so many, many governments, and and Russia is not even the one that does it by far. I mean, countries like like China and, and India and so have, have far more, um, but they, they, they had these reserves in dollars and euros because it's okay. safer. And we like that as a country, the United States likes this, that we like our other, other these other countries buying treasury bonds, buying our debt because it, 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 it supports our own economy and it keeps the strength of our currency and the strength of our currency at the end of the day is everything. It's, mm-hmm. it's the backbone of our economy. Right. It's the backbone of our power. Um, of our political and military power, right? Because we, our sanctions are nothing without the strength of our currency. Our military is nothing if we don't have the currency to to pay for all of the the the, the things that our military does. So anyway, strength of our currency. Um, so this is something we like. So this was a very controversial decision made, and it, it's unprecedented, where we would seize those assets. Now they were frozen, but it's another level to go seize them and decide what to do with them. When we've done things that are sort of similar in the past, it's, 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 it's slightly different. So for example, when Libya, when Gaddafi fell, we had frozen Libyan assets and we froze them so that Gaddafi couldn't use them. And then when a new government came, we gave it to them. We gave it back to them so that they could, so that, you know, we hunted those assets down and then gave it to them because these are the assets of the people. They shouldn't have been for Gaddafi to begin with. Um, This is a bit different because you're talking about taking Russian assets and you're not giving it to the Russian people. You're giving it to Ukraine. And while there is wide, broad consensus, and I would agree with this, on the onus on the Russian government to pay for the destruction of Ukraine, um, and any any negotiation at the end of this, and all wars end in a negotiation, any negotiation would include some kind of uh, financial exchange, repatriation, you know, something. That's that's all wars. Oh, that's very typical for all wars. But you're here, you're doing it early and, and you're doing it kind of unilaterally or multilaterally with Europe. And, um, and that was the, that was why it was controversial. I will tell you that a large, large group of national security officials, big national security officials, former states, secretaries of state and so on, um, all came out to support this move. Mm. And when I did my video on it, I didn't really take a position. It was really more that I wanted people to, to be aware because when they go and they they write about this and they 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 scream in support of it and and the members of Congress are screaming in support of it and Biden too, they aren't sharing that there is a potential negative ramification, and the ramification is that all those other countries that have reserves in our dollar, um, that aren't let's say Europe, right? It's not the UK where the UK doesn't have anything to worry about our relationship, but let's say it's China, um, or India. Or, or, or uh, there are a handful of other countries. They, you don't want them selling those assets. We, we, we want them to have assets in U.S. dollars. We want them to have those reserves. But if they fear that that any move that they do, 
that we could then freeze and then seize those assets, then countries around the world may just not want to, they may feel that it's a risky move to go buy those assets. Right. Um, and that has a ram if that has a Clearly, Charles Mingus III is very upset about this. He agrees. <laughs> I think he agrees. Yeah, I think he agrees. Sorry there is there's this potential consequence. People just need to be aware of it. And so I wanted to nerd out when I explained this on my own video. It said, you know, it's not that I'm not in support of it. It's, you know, I, I, if anything, I think it's inevitable. Um, it's it's part of any deal. I would have preferred to see it as part of a deal, but you don't know if Putin's going to fall. And in my experience, dictators don't fall that easily anyway. Um, so it may have been hard to get to regardless, but but it does have this potential consequence of countries just thinking twice. Right. They might be like, you know what, maybe I'll and maybe I'll invest in the Chinese, you know, Remnimbi, Remnimbi um, instead. And right. and that would be detrimental to to our own currency and our economy. And and so we have to be very careful of of any effort that could devalue our currency, in my opinion. So I was going to ask you if you're hopeful about the direction things are going, but it, it seems to me that you and correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe you don't get hopeful or discouraged. You just kind of you're more tracking with the facts on a day-to-day -day basis and it is what it is kind of a thing is that is that fair to say yeah that's a really good summary actually <laughs> um yes for sure and when it comes to ukraine um there was a period there that i was hopeful not so much that i thought the war would end yeah the war in ukraine much like the wars in syria and sudan and the congo to me to me, feel like it'll be long term, and uh, and that's unfortunate. But but the war in Ukraine really started in 2014 anyway. Mm. It's, it's just that the invasion happened in 2022. But in 2014 is when Russia annexed Crimea and started supporting separatists in eastern Ukraine. And so this is really when the conflict began. But that said, the the Ukraine one to me, I fear it'll last long. But there was a moment in time when they were really. Uh, last summer, they were making a lot of gains, mm -hmm. a lot of territorial gains. They were at the peak of of receiving Ukraine aid, um, and and actively pushing back on 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 Russian gains that had been made after February. And so, in my view, I wasn't I wasn't sure, and it's hard to predict whether they would gain all their land back. But in my view, I just saw that Ukraine was in a position of strength. And that by having that position of strength, their morale was high, Russian morale was low. Uh, they were able to recruit soldiers. Russia wasn't. They were recruiting from foreign mercenaries and 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 from their prisons and so on. You know, there were a lot you saw Putin grasping and 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 behaving desperately by by assassinating people and cracking down on his people even further. Obviously, you saw the death of Alexei Navalny and so on. All these signs that that in my mind, didn't portend an end to the war as much as Ukraine in a position of strength. And if, you, if Ukraine is in a position of strength, then they can go into negotiations holding Russia by the neck. And yeah. that's what you want, because otherwise wars could last forever. You're trying to get one side, your side, to a position of strength to the point where in negotiations they would walk out stronger. And then that balance tipped at the end of last year. And it tipped or it's kind of in this weird, annoying middle ground gray area. And a lot of that is because is directly because of the aid and our aid stalled because our aid stalled, European aid stalled. And I will tell you this, this is something I've seen over and over again. And this is throughout our history, but, uh, but in particular the last several years, I mean, when, since I've been working on these issues very closely, so for the last, uh, I guess, 20 years, um, where the U S is not present or where the U S does not lead, things falter and they mm. fail and they and they fester and you so, you see this everywhere if the US and the US can't be the world's policeman i understand that i'm not saying right. that we should police democracy around the world you know this is not so easy to do but where the US doesn't lead on something or doesn't come out strong you start to see nefarious actors take advantage of it or just things get weak and they don't, and it's hard for us to achieve our national security objectives. And so when we started weakening on, on Ukraine, when Congress started really being difficult about that at the end of last year, Europe also did the same thing. And when we finally passed our Ukraine aid, Europe then followed, right? It's, 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 but, but in that, that time period, those were really crucial months, the several months where Ukraine was so low on ammunition that they they had to retreat from certain areas completely because they were spread too thin. They had to prioritize other cities. And 
And, and the problem with that too is that it contributes to low morale. So Ukraine now is struggling again with recruitment uh, of, of soldiers. And so this, what I see now is this, it's this muddy area. The Ukrainian military is still a remarkable force to reckon with. I mean, what they have done from where they started is, is remarkable. And I would say in my, and I'm going to say it's my opinion, it's the deal of the century mm. to to support the Ukrainian military without you giving your troops right. because they genuinely are not only fighting back against Putin and 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 an effort on Putin to push further into Europe if if he succeeds they're fighting for democracy right. right it's the deal of a century you don't even have to send your troops there just give them the aid and they will do it for you they have shown they can go so far with that aid um this that faltering and 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 how much this has become an issue in European and U.S. elections concerns me deeply because it feels to me like we might end up seeing those negotiations and Ukraine not be in a position of strength where Ukraine is they're both kind of in this middle uh, middle ground where Ukraine is going to have to give up more than they'd like and um, and that could be that could be very painful but dragging this on is not an option um, I don't I, that aid is going to dry up. Regardless of who wins the election, it's going, you know, it's just a matter of time. So watching what's happening around the world gives us uh, some insights into some very real threats, I believe, um, into threats to democracy and democratic principles here at home. You shared um, <laughs> TikTok and YouTube. So you, you focus a lot on authoritarianism and dictatorships around the world um, and, and some, some affronts, some dangers, uh, threats to human rights and liberties. Um, I was watching one that you did back in 2021. Uh, it's a, it was a story about how uh, Belarus hijacked an international flight that flew in their airspace just in order to arrest a particular journalist who criticized the regime. Um, it, is it, and me being an American, I'm, it's always myopic for me, like how does this affect us? But um, feel free to share more about that story. But in particular, is it hyperbolic to be concerned that these types of actions can, could be carried out in a second Trump term, and if so, what what other concern? What else concerns you about the prospects of, of another Trump administration? Yeah. So what you're talking about has a term for it from the FBI, which is called transnational repression. And what it means is, and and so Belarus did this by bringing that plane down. But you see this uh, right now. But the Saudis do this. The uh, a lot the Iranian regime does this. The um, even Indian government is doing this. Where Chinese government, the Chinese regime does this all the time, and including in the United States. I mean, all of these all of these governments, including the United States, where they are, uh, they will export their repression by trying to silence or assassinate, in some cases, dissidents and activists abroad. Because yeah. the, they have people, you know, either they're regular citizens or they are known activists and dissidents who flee or who Im who emigrate and they go to air to countries where there's freedom of speech, whether it's in the United States or elsewhere, and they exercise that freedom of speech. And then those governments will find a way to try and silence them and intimidate them through a variety of different ways. So the Belarus bringing that plane down is an example of that. That was a journalist living in Lithuania, if I'm not mistaken. And... It was the, a plane going from, I think, from Greece to Lithuania, right? Yes, so it wasn't something even, like this. It didn't take off or land in Belarus. It was yeah. just flying in. Right. Yeah. Right, so. Had nothing to do with Belarus, although I think it was over Belarusian um, air when they brought it down, obviously. But this and and the moment it happened, the journalist knew what was happening. Right. Yeah. There's a lot about that, about how his girlfriend was on board with him. And, you know, and he was he was worried and he was saying, you know, I can't get out of the I, please don't let me get out of the plane. I don't want to get out of the flight. Um, and. Uh, and 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 other and you have a lot terrifyingly a lot of examples of this. You have the Indian government, uh, according to the Canadian and and U.S. governments, assassinated a Sikh leader in Canada. Uh, then they attempted to assassinate a Sikh leader in New York. Um, you have the Iranian government that attempted to kidnap, and when that failed, they attempted to kill a very famous Iranian American women's rights activist, also my friend Masih Alinejad, who fights against mandatory hijab. Um, you have uh, the Saudi government, who infamously uh, killed in, and brutally murdered 
uh, Washington Post columnist Jamal Khashoggi when he was in Turkey, right? So there are, you have a lot of these examples of authoritarian regimes who are so afraid by, they crack down on dissent in their own countries because they're so afraid of it, but they don't want their dissidents and citizens taking advantage of freedom of, of speech and freedom of expression or freedom of, of the internet outside to to continue pursuing that work because even no matter what they do inside their own countries their people are still able to find a way around the internet jamming around the bands to listen and hear these people and so they still pose a threat to them even outside their borders and they still go to pursue that type of um to, to crack down on it outside the borders this is a threat to our democracy because we cannot have that happen it's it our it's when you have a democracy where that is steeped in freedom of speech and freedom of expression, um, you can't have authoritarian regimes threaten anybody. You you can't allow that. You have to show that that that's not acceptable. And I do think the U.S. government is getting better about it. I think that there was a t- the FBI is really good at tracking it, and and if they see you know nefarious behavior or criminal behavior, they are on top of it. They're very good at this. But you're still seeing this boldness, this brazen behavior from these governments that continue to try to do this. And if you ask me under a Trump administration what would happen, it's really hard to say, to be honest with you, because it depends a little bit on the government. Um, You know, when you have so I'm going to be very I want to be very straight on this because I don't want to make it. I am myself. I will be very honest with you. I'm not a, a Trump supporter. It's really not hard to to, <laughs> to notice that if you watch my own videos. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah. do say I'm an equal opportunist when it comes to criticizing. Um, and I am. And I like to poke fun at everybody. But, but your Trump, uh, but your pretty, Trump uh, you know, impressions are spot on, by the way. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. It's you know, it's endless content. Endless. I, I say that it's free content. It's like it's given to me every week. It's a gift. Um, and uh, and uh, but it's not, you know, I I draw the I draw the line at the far right. When people ask me like who likes your content, I I I tell them it's pretty much everybody except the far right. Yeah. Um and uh and so uh and so and and, and so anyway, um when you have a leader like Trump who is very erratic and uh and a megalomaniac and who's who's crazy. Um that for an adversary can work in our favor because they are afraid, they become afraid to do anything. Mm -hmm. So when Trump ordered the assassination of General Qasem Soleimani uh, uh, of Iran, um, and that guy was awful. He was, he was, he is the reason for so much terror and, and death across the Middle East. Um, and when he was assassinated, you know, I remember being on air about, for all the big networks after that and saying, you know, this is going to be, you know, World War Three, and Iran is going to re- respond. And I kept telling people, I was like, there's no way they're going to respond because the fact that Trump went and did that is so crosses such a crazy red line. It they they're going to say to themselves, well, we don't what if we do something else? And then he just nukes us. You know, the right. guy's crazy. Who knows what he could do? So for for adversaries like Iran, that works in your favor. For adversaries like Russia, it might not because because uh, Trump has on many occasions uh, come out looking like he admires Putin, and that's terrifying for for many reasons, right? It's it's terrifying, and 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 he's very vocal about being against Ukraine aid. So there's clear he clearly has a side there. You know what concerns me with that is that what if what if you know what if Trump. Um, I I don't think he would I because he, because he's kind of an America first guy I don't think he's going to want any foreign government even if he likes the leader playing around in the United States at all in general um but my fear comes more from what if if he comes off like he's willing to negotiate on things that aren't weren't previously negotiable like for example we have here russian citizens who are under the witness protection program because right like one of the most uh, one of the most famous ones was the guy in the movie icarus the documentary icarus okay. um he was the one who who was the whistleblower on the steroid program that oh. uh, that the russian government was was engaged in and how the he was uh, how that olympic committee was you know Part part of that whole scandal, um, he did that, and the Russian government wants that guy 
you know, his name is escaping me at the moment. I'm sorry, but the documentary is amazing. It's called Icarus. They want him at any cost. And so what if Trump is willing to negotiate on him? That's something that that Biden would never do, for example, right. because that would be a front to our democracy. Um, and so it's things like that 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 could that concern me. But I'm you know, I'm speaking out of turn here. You know, I'm speculating. I don't know. My my concern for Trump uh, administration and our democracy is more about our domestic policies than the than how he is on authoritarians. It's much more about what could he do? What could he undo? Um, could he really, you know, what if he uh, tries, what if he disputes again the election? What if he wins and then he disputes at the end of the second term? And try, You know, I, I don't really know. I just, I, all I know is that his first term highlighted to me how fragile our own democracy is. Yeah. And that our system of checks and balances is not as perfect as we thought it was. Right. And- um, and that's that concerns me when it when it comes to our rights and freedoms. Yeah, no. If you if you look at any of uh, Project Twenty Twenty Five, for example, you can yeah. see that there's actually a plan to start gutting um, the people who who populate uh, a lot of our institutions that hold our democracy together, our democratic republic, if you like, together. Um, so that's that's what I'm really concerned about is that he might actually or the people that around that are around him might be more effective at gutting those institutions so that um, the the fissures that were opened in the first term uh, can then be cracked um, so that, you know, uh, on January 6th, there's enough votes in, in Congress to, you know, uh, to vote for a, a an alternate set of electors, for example, we don't even know, but um, there are there is uh, uh, those institutions are a lot more brittle than than we realized. So that's what concerns me the most. Man, there's so much more I wanted to get into. I'm going to have to have you back because I really do want to talk about your background. <laughs> you know, when you when you because uh, it was interesting. I, I thought that um, you got into politics and world uh, affairs when you were in college, but. I, I had read that that was something, um, e, e, I guess it was in high school that mm -hmm. uh, a mentor. I, so a couple more questions. And one I did want to talk about your champions, as you call them. When did you start to seek out mentors? Like, how did you even know um, the, that, that there was a value in having mentors? And how did you nurture these types of, of relationships? That's a good question. Um, I think it was probably at the very, very start of my career, um, when I, when I grad, I, so I did, I did undergrad and graduate school straight through. I went to Barnard and then, and then the school of international public affairs where I teach. So I did that in five years and I had taken a conditional offer of employment, but from the CIA to be an analyst with the CIA, they wanted me as an operative. Mm. Um, but, uh, and I was, I entertained it. I thought it was really fascinating and really interesting. And wait, so wait, they wait. told me what, how do we know yeah. that you're not actually an operative now? And this is you, all a <laughs> you can't know. <laughs> That's awesome. That is the beauty of it. <laughs> um, so you know when I but when I learned about the day to day life of an operative abroad, I was not. I didn't find it so sexy after all. It wasn't okay. like in the movies. It's a lot of like driving around and picking up sources. I, that was not for me. Yeah. And 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 it's it's a really much more like introverted life. And as you can tell, I'm really not that introverted. <laughs> so so I decided against it. And then. Um, so you, so I would have you believe. And, um, and I decided that the anal analysis part was, was really exciting to me. And, uh, so I accepted this offer of employment that's conditional on me getting my security clearance. And in the meantime, I went to Capitol Hill to work for my congressman from Connecticut at the time, Chris Shays, who was, um, the, the last of the moderate Republicans, uh, that kind of moderate doesn't exist anymore. And, you know, mm. people, when they talk about moderate Republicans now, um, it's, it's, he was moderate Republican in my view. Um, maybe now he'd be center left or center left and right. Um, but anyway, so just center, he'd probably be independent. So, um, amazing guy to work for, but anyway, I, but it wasn't what I wanted to do. And after a year of it, I was, I was, I was struggling. I wasn't getting this clearance. It wasn't coming through. Uh, my family's all over the world, not exactly an easy clearance to get. Um, and, that's when I, I left Capitol Hill and I gave myself two months to figure out what I was doing. And I kept my apartment in Washington and I, I asked everybody I knew for an informational interview, grad school friends, cold reached out to people, um, the friends of my parents, the parents of my friends, you named it. And it was that period where I started to, especially the, you know, the, the, 
friends of parents and parents of friends, where I started to find the value in these, in mentors, in, in an older group who may not have anything to do with my field, but would just guide me or give me advice that made me feel better, made me feel like I was headed towards somewhere or that, that, or maybe they knew somebody who could help me or whatever. And so that's when, that's when it started. And then along my career at treasury and in the government, um, the interesting part is that the majority, the vast majority of my bosses, and I think I was, I don't know if this was unique or, or lucky, but I, I, the 12 years I was in government, I never once felt, even though I was often the only woman in the room, I never once felt this, you know, the, any, any, like I was, like I was being mansplained or sidelined or on the contrary, my bosses who were all men only empowered me, only pushed me to be at the table in their stead, pushed me to take whatever trip it was in their stead. Um, it was a very, and that was at the treasury, that was at the White House. It was a very unique uh, experience. And it has not been my experience in the media world at all, oh. by the way, which we could get into. Now oh, wow. I under, yeah, it's only when I left government that I understood what every woman was talking about. But but in government, that's not that was not my experience at all. And all those men, I collected them as mentors too. And- okay. And because of that, because I knew how much they were supporting me. And so to this day, they're all my closest friends. And so I learned along the way with every, every failure or job I didn't get, um, there were always, it was always somebody, one of them, two of them, whomever was the relevant one for that job, um, or, or situation who would kind of take my hand and pull me up and, and tell me, you know, no, it's going to be okay. So it was a, a practice I learned early on. Um, and because, and I say this often, when you look at my resume, it's so easy to see like, Oh, how seamless it was. And Oh, shit, nothing but success. And, and if I told you how many jobs I didn't get in that process or things I didn't achieve or, or, you know, the PhD that I applied for that no school accepted me for, or, <laughs> you know, especially having your own media brand, how many, you know, quote, I put quote unquote failures. Cause I don't, it's like a failure, but it's, you know, you learn from it. It, it wasn't meant to be then it was right. Yeah. Um, but with each one of those, it, it, the first thing I do is go to my network of, of mentors and champions. And the champions are, and I call them champions because it's kind of mentors are really the ones that, you know, you'll sit down with them and you'll brainstorm or you're, they'll have real advice or real, um, you know, a connection or whatever it might be. The champions are really, for me, have been, um, the friends, uh, alums, moms in particular, who I've collected, who just kind of cheer me on. You know, if they see I'm having a hard time, they are the first ones to be like, you got this, keep going. Um, you know, or don't listen to that person or whatever it might be. And, uh, and it's, it's the only way to survive this. I, I would say maybe any career, yeah. you know, but if you're out there in the public and you have your own business in particular, then they've been, they've been extremely valuable in keeping me going and, and making sure that I continue to believe in myself. Cause there are times I believe in myself. That is a big part of doing any of this work yeah, or anything in, in general, I think in life, but yeah, of course you're going to have doubts. And so there are always times I have doubts. And when I see them believe in me, I'm like, yeah, you're right. Okay. Wait, let's, let's, let's forget those doubts. Like I'll go back to believing in myself and, and continue <laughs> and, you know, keep your head down and keep going. Um, so they're a value, a big, big part of my, my story. Have you ever been let down by a mentor? I've been, uh, not really. I've been let down by only one. Um, I would say it's not a mentor, but a champion, Okay, a champion who, who had wanted to invest in Oh My World. And, um, and uh, I don't think I've shared this story before. So as I told you, I was an open book and I promised you that at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and uh, this person, it was definitely a champion of mine, still is a champion of mine. But uh, but said but really strung me along for a year, saying that they wanted to invest in in Oh My World, and I believed it, and I made all these plans around it, and I was super excited. And for a year, I kind of worked on this business plan, and I worked on you know the the future, and 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 really focused on it. And and then when we met, the meeting blew up in my face. Oh. And to me, it felt like that per that person. See, your dog is angry for me as well. And <laughs> That's I right. thank you, thank you, fellow champion I've collected. That's um, right. That it. I don't know that they were serious about investing at all, um, in, in general. And, and I would add, by the way, that in that conversation, that person, that person asked me at a certain point when we went deliberated over equity for a long time and, 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 and it was a man. And he said, he said, you know, 
did you speak did you speak to your husband because he's a CFO he gets this maybe I'll talk to him oh. and then I'll get back to you yeah I couldn't believe what I was hearing wow I was like wow I've heard stories about this and now it's actually happening to me um so that was a real that was a real disappointment but and as you can tell, I'm quite the optimist and I was really let down. And mm. the very first thing I did, this was, by the way, the end of 2022. The first thing I did was reach out to my network of mentors yeah. and um, of like, you know, where do I go now? I was expecting this money. This money's not coming in. All of these plans, some of the plans I had put in motion, you know, that like I had to finish, I had to pay for. And I reached out to all of them and kind of made you know, took the advice from all of them and mixed it and came out with new plan, a new plan, new plans going forward where, uh, I funded everything myself through 2023. And, and I think it was, and I always say this, that I think it was meant to be because I don't think, oh, my world was really ready for an investment at that time. Anyway, it, it, I, I wasn't pitching for investment. It was only because he was interested that I did it, that I went through the process. And I really don't think it was ready. Number one. And number two, I don't think he might have been the right person to answer to then. Yeah. You know, I mean, when you when you're doing this, you're giving a chunk of your business to somebody who's investing. You have to make decisions together. And and uh and so I think for a lot of reasons it worked out the way it was meant to be. But but hindsight is always 2020. It felt like shit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I was really devastated in the moment. Yeah. I, I've had folks that I look to to be as as mentors. Um, and the two that come to mind, one I realized, and it took me like a decade and a half to realize this person the whole time was really just playing me. Like yeah. they, they, um, they wanted to have me kind of on their side to keep me close enough so that I couldn't do any harm to their interests. And that really was the common currency of why uh, we had met on a regular basis. Um, and I just, I saw this person in a very different light the entire time. It's just how, maybe how ignorant or naive I am. The other one was much more, it really shook my faith. I've talked about this before on this show. I became, a, so I grew up very observantly Jewish, but I became a Christian when I was 29 years old. One of mm -hmm. my mentors who kind of- Oh, like uh, me, we're all members of every tribe. <laughs> every tribe, yeah, I'm an absolute <laughs> mutt. Um, but uh, one of my mentors I had been listening to his, his, um, his talks, going to his seminars, reading his books. Uh, it turned out after he passed away, we learned he wasn't who he said he was. He was a serial sexual predator. Oh and God. I, I thought I knew this man. I knew his family, like, uh, you know, and, and that just really, it, that revelation forced me to go back and re-examine everything that was connected to what I thought I learned from him. Um, so, um, it, 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 others have helped me, um, along the way to kind of re-examine what I needed to re-examine, but also, um, reestablish uh, a foundation so that I could at least stand on steady ground, theologically, philosophically, uh, morally. Um, so that's been helpful, but also it's helped me to, uh, it's helped me to think about, well, it, if there are others who are looking to me in any kind of light like that, if I, you know, if I'm be, being a mentor, what is the kind of person that I'd want to be for them, you know? Um, so that's that my one of my last questions is whether ha, do you find yourself becoming a mentor now? Oh, yeah, I love I find it. It's a way to pave it, you know, pay it forward. Yeah. So I have a lot of mentees. Um, they 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 mostly tend to be young women. Um, and that's and that's really because the schools will reach out to me right. or they will reach out to me. Right. These, yeah. these young women in general reach out to me. Um but I went to an all girls school, uh, for my, you know, for, for, from fifth grade through senior year. Um, and, uh, and, and then I went to Barnard, which is an all women's uh, college. And so, so the schools will reach out to me often as well with, with students. Um, and I love doing it because I just, I don't know why, especially sometimes when I see myself in that person, yeah. uh, you know, it's like, let me tell you what I would have told young Hagar, you right. know, and, um, and which is always always some derivative of like, it's all going to be fine, you know, just, yeah. And, and, and do what you love and it'll work out. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, don't be so worried about it and don't be, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll fall into place and then enjoy the ride while you're at, while you're on it. Right. Um, but, uh, but no, I think I, I find it a really important part. I take, there is, I would say at least, at least once a month, there are periods of time when it could be once a week. Sometimes I think it depends on the school year where I'm doing some kind of phone or zoom with 
a young college student or high school student um, or recent grad to mentor them. And, um, and I know my husband is always telling me like, you know, you have zero time. How on, why, <laughs> why are you making time for this? I'm like, because I don't know. It's just important to me. You know, this was a big part of where, of why I got to where I got and how I made decisions that, that when in the moment it's hard to put yourself out of it and make a decision that makes sense. Yeah. You need someone else looking from the outside and, um, and I feel a duty to pay it forward. Um, but I enjoy it. I think it's just cause I simply enjoy it. You know, I like listening to them and, and asking them questions. And it's so funny too, because sometimes I feel like I'm the same age as my mentees. <laughs> it's the same at school. I feel like I'm the same age as my, um, students. And then there are a lot of moments that come up that I'm like, well, in my day, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I guess yeah. we're not the same age. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, when you start making like friends references and they're like, wait, what? Who? Yeah, or, or I'll say, I'll be like, well, in my day, email wasn't a big thing until college. Like, so in high school, we didn't email because like internet was just born. <laughs> yeah, know? yeah. And that's the truth. <laughs> so, totally. You know, like, or social media, we didn't, we were, none of us were on social media. So sometimes they'll say something and I'm like, you know, honestly, it sounds like it sucks to be young on social media, like, Seriously. you know, and uh, I have no comparison for that. Um, thank God. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, but I do, but I do believe very deeply in, in mentoring and paying it forward for sure. <laughs> okay. So my, our T, TP and R question, I, I ask all of our guests, what do you think each of us can do to be able to share space with, have better conversations with, perhaps even nurture relationships with people across our differences. So that's people who have different backgrounds and beliefs than we do, who get their news from different sources than we do. Um, how can we do better at talk of politics and religion without killing each other, or is it even possible? It is possible. It oh, is good. possible. <laughs> it is possible for sure. Um, I, it, oh God, I find like when I, when I convince people of this, it's, it's one by one, which, you know, given how many people are in the United States would take a long time. But if I were to give any advice on it, some of it is to listen or look or watch or read whatever, however you consume news or, or information um, to those with whom you disagree as, as angering as sometimes it can be, yeah. you know, there are a lot of times I want to unfollow certain, certain folks, yeah. um, a range of them. And sometimes I'll even go, you know, I'll see their post, uh, on Twitter or on Instagram or whatever it might be. And then I'll go and I'll be like, Oh, I do follow this person. And then I'm like, should I unfollow? And then I'm like, no, you no, keep it because you need to know what they're saying and you need to know what their masses of followers are believing or listening to or watching or whatever. Um, but I think it's important because it gives you this perspective of, you know, like it, you don't want, it's not healthy to be in a bubble. So some of it is to make sure to follow um, or listen or watch to something that you disagree with. And then the second, and the, and the only second part is that um, to, I don't know what the right word is for this. It's like, like to calm down, but like, <laughs> but to, <laughs> because people are so agitated, you know, and, and and by the way, social media is designed to do that to right. you. Yeah. And headlines are designed to do that to you. There was a headline from the New York Times yesterday that said, you know, UN Security Council resolution passes ceasefire proposal, but neither the Israelis nor the Palestinians have formally accepted, which was not only factually inaccurate, but they were trying, it's factually inaccurate, but they put that there. Why? To to, to get you to read it. Yeah. Like, why on earth is the UN passing a resolution that the Israelis and Palestinians don't accept? First of all, they did accept it. Both sides accepted it, both the Israeli government and the Palestinian Authority. And then today Hamas accepted it. Oh, so, yeah. I was going to so, ask you about that. Okay. So that's a new development. Yeah. 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 Which means that now they sit at the table to hammer out the details, but okay. there are a lot, like I said, at the beginning of this, there are a lot of reasons. I see a lot of moving parts that make that make it feel like we're reaching an end to the intense part of the war. Um, but anyway, so, or to this immediate ceasefire at least. And so, um, but that headline, you know, I saw this and I, like I said, I got angry about the numbers, the way they were portraying these numbers at, you know, headlines in general, stating the 274 dead as a fact and, and, and making you feel like, you know, four Israelis for 274, but what a weird way to even say this. And they do that just by design. Yeah. They're doing it to, ev to evoke, to, to say something provocative, to evoke an emotion, because that makes you click on something or read something. And that's more money and dollars and advertising for them. And so it's, oh, and I do the same thing. You have to calm down, calm, like calm and ask questions. Right. And like, is this totally the way they're 
p- portraying it? How is how are how are those on the other side portraying this? Um, and or if somebody says something, you know, maybe ask questions and don't come out with hate and just be like, but wait a minute, I understood this differently. How come your view is this? I really just want to understand. Instead of like, you know, coming out with some kind of hate-filled expression. Yeah. It's, it's it's not healthy for anybody, it, it, mostly you. It's toxic. Um, and so those are the two things I would say is, you know, I, different sources, range yeah. of sources, and and calm the F down. <laughs> <laughs> you can say fuck. That's okay. We yeah. have the explicit rating. Um, so I love it. I love it. So what uh, – do you have any questions for me? Well, you know, one of the things I've been wondering as as we've been talking is how you – launched your podcast like what motivated you to launch this podcast about a topic that is so necessary right now like what when did you do it and what was the impetus you know what inspired you that's so i've been asked a version of that question before and i often refer to when i became a christian you know it forced me to have difficult conversations with my family in particular my father about religion our religious background our heritage our people um as well as once i started going to church i realized wow, what was so compelling to me about Rabbi Yeshua ben Yosef, Rabbi Jesus, uh, and the words that I was, I was his Devar Torahs that I was reading in, in New Testament, that wasn't the most compelling thing to a lot of people that I was going to church with about why they identified as Christians. A lot of people, I would say a majority of people I was going to church with, social and political positions came, were primary. Um, and this is going back in the early 2000s. Um, and not only that, the social and political positions were already being defined um, primarily by who who the enemy, who the adversary was. Uh, so I've talked about that before, but the part that I haven't talked about, this is kind of funny. Um, I was around a lot of tables, um, whether it was our, you know, Shabbos table or Thanksgiving table at home or other, you know, uh, lunch, you know, going to lunch with uh, more than one person at a time. I, I was, I, I, throughout my childhood and my young adult life, I realized that when important issues that I was really, really interested in, when it comes to politics and social issues, especially theological issues, I was always a voracious reader. Uh, I was always, you know, um, passionately engaged and asked deep existential questions. And yet when those conversations arose, the people, uh, there were certain people who basically dominated most of the conversation, whether it was just once you're sometimes it's just when two people are in the conversation but certainly when it's more than two people three four five people around a table um there's typically one person who dominates 80 percent of of the dialogue that happens there and that just really frustrated me (laughs) yeah um and, and oftentimes that person who's dominating the conversation it's either the person who's just the loudest and most assertive not necessarily often the opposite of the most informed um, but what, what occurred to me is, um, when I was able, when I started observing others at the table who weren't speaking and then later on in Thanksgiving day or whatever, I, I would, I would get one-on-one with some of those quiet people at the table. I would find, oh, this is a really informed person or, oh, this person has well-formed views about this. They're really interesting that I want to learn more about this person, but they don't have the oxygen to be able to, to speak. Um, you know, if you take some of my favorite guests on the show, um, Monica Guzman, I, I mentioned before, um, David Brooks, Pete Weiner just came on, Mike Madrid, you know, they're, um, uh, Danielle Allen, you know, they're not conflict entrepreneurs, although Mike, Mike knows how to throw a few bombs when he wants to, but, um, yeah, you know, funny. they're not conflict entrepreneurs. Danielle is not going to write a piece for the Washington Post or any of the other, pla- um, for, for, uh, the work that she does at Harvard in order to instigate that sense of anger and fear that contra- conflict, uh, that's their basic currency, right? Um, but those are the very people I am most interested in hearing from, you know? Mm. So that's why I wanted to do this. But the biggest reason is that as early as 2002, 2004, certainly by 2008, when Sarah Palin came on the scene, I realized that more so than any particular issue, guns, abortion, immigration, just any issue, we didn't know how to talk to each other or about others who disagreed with us on a particular issue. So if we couldn't figure that out and how to talk to each other and how to have a better understanding of those people, 
who you know feel differently about these issues than we do if we could if we didn't figure out how to disengage from the mischaracterizations over generalizations and demonizations of them our perceived adversaries then we were going to lose everything we we're going to we weren't going to be able to solve anything so that's probably a longer answer to your question but that's that's all the ingredients that were going into it <laughs> no but it's fascinating you know it's funny the sarah palin note that you made because um that for me her coming onto the scene during the mccain campaign was um was transformative in that well first of all i didn't really know about the tea party i didn't know about the far right at all i felt like i didn't know my own country but i was a registered republican had voted republican maybe it was a little mixed i mean connecticut republicans are are unique um but uh when yeah, i was actually came, hoping that that he'd pick uh, lieberman a, a, not a connecticut yeah. republican but a connecticut uh, independent at that point right most of us did and and yeah. i understood why i mean you know his campaign it was so obvious like they, it's like they wanted a woman they wanted you know but like Sarah Palin, I mean, there weren't other women. I'm pretty sure there were other Republican <laughs> women he could have chosen from. Yeah. And, you know, in his book, he talks about how it was the biggest regret for biggest regret, not just for his campaign and his um, and the whole the whole election. But because he said he he in his book, I don't want to paraphrase, but it well, I'm going to paraphrase, but um, I hope I don't get it wrong. It was something along the lines about how he he takes some ownership for in empowering this entire community yeah. that was really pretty much under wraps up until that point. Right. And, um, but when Sarah Palin came on the stage, I remember, um, I, I was, you know, McCain was a big, um, partner of my bosses of crochets and, uh, and I, and I always liked him. And then when he invited Palin on the scene, I was like, wait, what, what, what is this? Yeah. I can't, I can't vote for this. And I voted for Obama. I was a registered Republican. I voted for Obama. And then when, and that was really the turning point of, you know, this political shift for me or not really, I don't really think I changed that much to be honest with you. I, the parties changed. Yeah. And, um, and then when I voted for Obama the second time was when I was like, okay, maybe I should register independent. And so when people ask me where I sit, I always tell them I'm a centrist and I really am. And, and I get a lot of people who watch my show and they're always like, I can't tell, you know, what side you're on. And I'm like, because I'm good. not really, yeah. yes, it is good. It is good. And I'm not, I always say I'm an equal opportunist when it comes to criticizing and, um, the human rights stuff is very, is quite to the left, right? Like, you know, very pro, um, choice and women's rights and pro LGBTQ plus rights and so on. Um, but foreign policy, my views on foreign policy tend to be more center right than center left. You know, I really get annoyed at a week, like a weak administration in the face of, of, of adversaries, yeah. which you could probably tell, as you could tell, sure. um, you know, so, and that's more to the right. So, you know, I'm a mix, um, as, as Connecticut, nutmeggers are <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah but anyway so when you said that i was like oh i know i remember that time period yeah, you know, that was moment. transformational for me too mm -hmm. all right so one more time how can folks follow you find more information about oh my world uh, oh my all the world great work that you're doing yeah thank you so much Corey. well thank you so much for having me on i'm so appreciative you can find oh my world really wherever you are so <laughs> it's it lives on youtube please please subscribe it means the world to me it makes such a huge difference um but it's all all the content is also shared on instagram and and tiktok at at oh my world show and you can find me personally if you want to follow me personally on uh, again any of the platforms uh at at geek out with hagar because i always say to geek out with me when I, when I nerd out. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and hit, hit me up if you'd like to sign up for our newsletter so that you're aware of at the end of the week, I kind of sum up all of the videos that we put out and, and the news, then you can sign up for the newsletter at our website at ohmyworld.tv. Awesome. I'll be sure to put those in the show notes. So it's really e easy for folks to find you. It's a, it's a good, um, it's well worth your time. I get these notifications now uh, every time a new video is posted. So I feel like I'm staying well informed just by, uh, at, at the very least, I'm well informed on all of your new wigs and costumes. <laughs> yes. And I was going to say, the whole point is to make you laugh, to, yeah. to digest this depressing news in a way that's going to keep you coming back. And so I impersonate a lot of world leaders. I I'm often in a wig and a bad accent and uh, which wasn't the plan when I launched on my world. It just kind of developed as it, uh, as time wore on. Um, but it is my favorite thing to do. The political satire is my favorite part. I just realized this. So um, I, up until about a week ago, I had about a foot and a half of hair um, of gray. For real? Totally. Yeah. In fact, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see, wait, <gasps> that mop over there. there is your hair. That's my hair. 
So I might have to what donate that What are you doing with you. it? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, the, so- uh, I my, can use it. it. They cut it off and, and um, Lisa just ended up, my wife ended up um, saving the hair. It was so much yeah. hair. Oh, so like a baby. Like, yeah. If, <laughs> <laughs> so if you ever wanted like a John Adams wig or something, I have the uh, the, the ingredients for you. You uh, know, it's good to know. I might hit you up for it. Thanks for the offer. I appreciate awesome. it. <laughs> well, Hagar, this is an absolute joy. And I insist, if you're okay with it, that we do this again, because there's so much more to talk about. I love to come back on. It was such a fun conversation with you, Corey. Oh, Anytime. Good. I really would love it. Oh, that'd be great. I, I'm, I'm so glad. I feel like I made a new friend. I, I felt like a friend already because I was consuming so much of your content and doing, getting ready for this conversation. But now getting the advantage to speak with you directly is really a joy. So thank you again. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And likewise, um, uh, it's been a wonderful conversation and you are a new friend as well and a new geek, uh, a new geek. To, of Oh My World. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. And as always, if you dig what we're doing here, remember to follow the show and write that review. And now you can join the conversation on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash politics and religion. Uh, check it out. Subscribe. Get some TPNR coffee mugs. <laughs> really excited about that. Now, Go talk some politics and religion with gentleness and respect and have a great week.